the culture part with martin morrison welcome to the culture part the show that celebrates the music the culture and the people of the world as you know we like to celebrate people who have a journey to share something that's going to uplift that's going to inspire and give hope um, and today's guest is no different today's guest was a publican for a long time he was a landlord uh, until something that he could never have anticipated or guessed would happen to him in a million years happened and it completely and utterly changed his life these days he's a professional speaker a motivational speaker and he specializes in resilience um, dealing with senior school children, high school children, and also people in further education. Um, I met him first of all in Sheffield last year, and then I had the fortune to bump into him today in a virtual meeting with the Professional Speaking Association. So here he is, Roger Cheatham. Thank you very much for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm very well indeed. Thank you, Martin, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be the guest on your show today. You're very welcome. Honestly, it's always a pleasure and a privilege for, for me to, to talk to people like yourself, Roger. I believe that you've been through some kind of transformation because of what happened to you. Um, and whoever you were before, if you like, wasn't 100% chosen. It will have been, like many people, the result of expectations, programming, if you like, conditioning that have come through childhood and sometimes it takes a traumatic event to make us reflect and to realize we're not on the right track so take us back to your childhood Roger how did it all begin I'm from Rotherham in South Yorkshire and I'm the son of a retired steel worker Paul and my late mum Marie was a shorthand typist something that in today's world of technology no longer exists but growing up as part of a working class family very proud of my working class roots because authenticity is very or very important to me so don't claim to be something that i'm not but at the same time neither am i ashamed of my background i have a sister claire I also now have a wife called Claire that both spell it differently so I have to be very careful when it comes to writing Christmas and birthday cards so I don't offend the both of them but yeah I uh, grew up in a house of, of love and usual sort of child of the 70s being born in 69 and growing up through the 70s and into the 80s that was my childhood. Well, I'll tell you what, before I delve deeper with some questions, um, okay. let's pick a track. What's your first track that you want to play today? Right. So as we're talking about childhood, I, from quite a young age, wanted to go into IT when I grew up. So for me, life was about getting home from school, getting my homework done, and then spending my evenings in front of my Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which for some of your younger viewers, that'll be like something of a, a museum piece. So for that reason, for the first song today, I would like to request Computer Love from Kraftwerk. But did you want to work in IT? Did you have dreams about maybe programming games or whatever? I very much wanted to work in IT from that age onwards. I wasn't sure in what capacity. Probably at that time I wasn't thinking so much about the game side of things. And as it happens, moving on after school, I went to college and did a BTEC diploma in computer studies. And my first job was in computer operations which was quite interesting because back then yeah, the computer room that I was based in as an operator was very much like you see on the old-fashioned James Bond film where things look like the big old-fashioned spindle tapes and the fixed discs that look something like the old-fashioned washing machines did and when I look now at sort of the technology that was in that machine room as we call the computer room. There's probably more now in the average calculator, let alone the average smartphone. 
how do you end up going from being an, an IT guy to a publican? <laughs> That's quite a big change. That's almost another interview. Yes, definitely. I mean, back to childhood, I was very much brought up that you focused on what you wanted to do. You got qualifications that were relevant to that. And back then, the belief was that a job was a job for life, which was very much the case back then. And funnily enough, you mentioned 1988, because that was the year I got my first job as well. So there's more synchronicity between us as the interview goes on than either of us realised. And I worked in IT for approximately 12 years, starting out in operations, working my way through the ranks there, then finding myself as a COBOL programmer, which again is probably sounding like a history lesson for some of your listeners. From there, I went into fourth generation languages and worked as a support programmer and had a thoroughly good 12 years, or I would say at least 10 or 11 of the years. Mm -hmm. However, I got to the point then where obviously we're always growing, we're always evolving and I decided that no longer was that a fit for me. I'd become very much a people person and as I jokingly say now, looking back, I just decided I'd had enough at looking at a blank screen with a matching expression and decided to sort of look what was people focused out there for okay. many years I've been a real L fan so I decided to uh, take a role as a, a pub landlord and I thought that was right for me moving forward Alright, well before we move on give me another song well, I mentioned that my mum is my late mum and she was always a really big Elvis Presley fan I mentioned that her name was Marie so tying the two together let's go for Elvis Presley's Marie's the name of his latest play. Roger, you were told us you've been working in IT, you've been working in one of these rooms in the late 1980s and the 90s because you were in this job for about 15 years, I think, with the massive spools, very old fashioned technical place. It doesn't exactly make me think about motivational speakers. <laughs> but then you thought, right, you decided you wanted to move away from that and you decided because you like real ale, ale you were going to go into the pub game is that right yeah i think it was the love for real ale combined with the fact that i had evolved to become a real people person it just seemed the natural way to go tell us about the process of, of how you made that transition i made the transition i think we're both of a mindset where we agree that you're very much drawn towards something or driven away from something and it was very much a case of me needing to leave the IT world behind me which had served me very well still have some good friends today that are in IT so I'm not going to knock that whatsoever it was just a case that IT and I had very much grown apart so I need I realized moving forward that I needed something that I could be enthused about once again and enjoy doing and get passionate about. There had to be some form of transition stage. So I got a part-time bar job at a local pub alongside still working in IT and made it very clear as to the reasons as to why I was getting into the pub. I got on really well with the management couple at the pub at the time and I remember to this day before I made the decision to get into the pub him saying to me, Roger just remember if you decide to go down the road of running a pub when you take on a pub you're not taking on a job you're taking on a way of life and I can honestly say that is really up there among some of the best advice that I've ever been given in my 50 years on this planet so far. And because Mike was aware of the fact that I wanted to go into the pub trade rather than I just was taking this on as a second job just for an extra bit of beer money or whatever it may have been, he was really good with me and 
taught me the management side of the pub, everything from the stock control systems to how to clean out the lines to being present there, seeing deliveries in, the real depth that most pub staff wouldn't see or indeed be interested in in most cases. So by the time I actually took my first pub back in May 2000, I was aware of what was involved and as time went on, became very, very, very aware of just how relevant that advice was that running a pub isn't in fact a job, it is indeed a way of life. It's a good job that you had a passion for real ale, didn't you? Yes, and, and that makes me smile actually because I had a real passion for real ale. The pub that I'd been working in all had bright beer. For anyone that's into the beers, will know the difference in a, in a real ale and a bright beer. I remember having the first delivery of real ale in the pub that I took and looking at this firkin, and that's not me using any foul language on your show, it's a, we the, 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 uh, a, a nine gallon uh, barrel. And looking at that and thinking, I haven't got a clue, because it's a sealed unit, how to get the beer from there to the pump. And I was I was ringing Mike up, and because he'd had real ale pumps previously, he had to teach me over the phone, and, Obviously, going back then, we didn't have video calling or YouTube videos to teach mm -hmm. how to do anything. So he had to talk me blind through what a tap looked like, what a peg looked like, and teach me, talk me through the whole process of tapping and venting a real ale barrel. So that's one of my earliest, more humorous and fondest memories of my first real ale pub. Okay. Well, before we move on a little bit deeper, um, tell us your next song. My next song, I've done one for my mum, so it's only fair that I play one for my dad because Sunday mornings back in childhood were the music morning where we'd alternate between Elvis Presley for my mum and The Hollies for my dad as well as whatever myself and my sister wanted to listen to. So I'm going to go with The Hollies, Just One Look. You've given us some insight uh, into what it was like training to um become a publican and some of what you said wasn't new to me actually because it turned out my old father-in-law when i was married he was a publican and i remember him being really excited about learning how to do this i think you're either into it or you're not yeah, yeah. um but then you know the learning curve can only go on for so long in terms of the technicalities of being a public I'm guessing and then it's the hard graft of doing it day in day out sorting it out so tell us a, a little bit more about your journey in respect to those years how long were you a publican and what did you learn and did you ever look back or did you ever sit there and go there must be some bit more that's what I want you to delve into now well, that's deep, but I'm a very open book, so no problem at all with that, Martin. I absolutely loved the social aspect of pub life. I had no issue with that whatsoever. However, I, as I think I mentioned, got into the pub trade along with my wife, Claire, in the year 2000 and was very much following my heart, which I would encourage anyone to do. That said, I would now say follow your heart, but with a caveat of researching what it is that you want to do, because whilst I was absolutely passionate about being in the pub trade, looking back, it had probably been in decline since the 80s, I would say, if I had to put a date on it, and by 2000, we were probably getting into the trade as it was a long way down the downward curve. So whereas when I'd been back in IT, that had been very financially rewarding. I think at age 30, my top line salary was about 30,000 a year, which again, I know a lot of people don't like talking about money. But I, I have no issue with it. So back at that time, 
that was sort of a lot of money to be uh, to be paid as a, as a top line figure, and particularly in the north of England, because I think back then there were probably something more of a north south north south divide pay wise than there is these days. So it's often said that only a fool works for nothing, and there were certainly occasions looking back to those days where Claire would sit down and do the books at the end of the week we'd have both worked 80 hour weeks whilst bringing up our daughter Tash and at the end of the week we'd not even hit the break even point and to say that only a full works for nothing I can't think of a term that could be used in polite company as we're in today that could be used to describe someone who works an 85 hour week to lose money so that was the the downside of it yes it was a hard job i mean a lot of my regular customers were really envious they saw the job as, as having a game of pool and a couple of beers with the lads and thinking that getting paid for that was the job that they really wanted to be in they didn't see the being up at six o'clock in the morning on an icy November morning to see the deliveries in and then clean the lines and then have the two open fires stoked up and lit and the till floated up. So I'd already put a five and a half hour day in before the doors even opened at 11.30 in the morning. Quite often then 12 hours on the bar on my own before cashing up at the end of the night and then doing our own cleaning at the end of the night because there just wasn't the budget there for a cleaner. So that side of it, I very much don't miss, but the social side of it, I thoroughly enjoyed for those 13 years. It almost, even though the two things are very much on the opposite side of the spectrum, it sounds as though being a publican was very much like being a priest. You're, you're open you know, all the time and you are acting as a pillar in the community just in a different way very much so yeah i must admit martin that's the first time i've ever been compared to a priest but i get what you're saying with the role because quite often i would joke that as a publican the actual serving of drinks to people was well down the list that before that i was a financial advisor i was a, a samaritan i was a marriage guidance counselor on occasions a boxing umpire so yeah I can really relate to what you say there where you made the comparison to the priest. So um, did you find and I guess this is leading up to where you went in life did you find that that was actually more rewarding than serving the beer? I guess in a way I did because Whilst as a publican, people would celebrate things like 18th and 21st birthdays with you and golden weddings and such. That was the exception rather than the norm. Most people coming into pubs, specifically the ones that would sit at the bar and want a listening ear, didn't usually want that listening ear because they were going to tell you how good life was. It was usually about the money worries they'd had, the stand-up argument they'd had with the boss that day, the, re the most recent argument they'd had with the spouse or something like that. So really they were just looking to me for that positivity, that reassurance and in a way that escaped from reality. Okay, well um, I think this is a really good point for you to tell us your next track. And then we're going to go to the next stage of evolution in our life of Roger Cheatham. What's your next song, Roger? I know we seem to be spending a lot of time in my childhood here. My sister was a big fan of Adam and the Ants. And therefore, we're going to go with Adam and the Ants. And specifically, Stand and Deliver. It's been great chatting to you today. And I guess we've reached that Thank point you. where we're going to get to the crux of the matter. Um, and we're going to see, if you like, we're going to take you through the black hole and bring you out to the new universe, the new Roger Cheatham who sat here talking to me today, because something pretty big happened to you, didn't it? So um, tell us about that. Tell us about the day and uh, be as suspenseful as you want. Okay, deep breath time. So the 9th of June, 
2013 is what I now look back and positively describe as my transformational day, though it very much wasn't the case at the time. I'd had a particularly uneventful day at the pub, working behind the bar. It had been a long Sunday where I had been the only person on duty that day, so I had done over 12 hours behind the bar, having done all the prep work before that. The time was just before midnight on a Sunday night, and I left the pub to take my beloved black and white Patterdale Terrier dog Jasper for his end of evening walk. After closing, everything seemed absolutely fine. It's a route we'd take many times before. Just before we got back to the pub, and totally out of the blue, there were three people waiting for us on a street corner, each wearing masks and balaclavas, each of them brandishing a baseball bat and pretty apparent of what's coming next, I'm sure. There was a violent attack. I will leave on the whole to the imagination the attack. Suffice to say to each and every one of you listeners out there today, I genuinely hope that you never find yourself laying in the road, hearing the sound of your own bones break, and each time you swallow, tasting your own blood. But that is a situation you would have found me in on the 9th of June 2013. Fortunately, my protests at being attacked alerted a neighbour, and therefore, due to her quick thinking and even quicker acting, within minutes of the attack ending, I was literally scooped into an ambulance and taken to Sheffield's Northern General Hospital. So I know at the moment we're all out there clapping for the NHS at eight o'clock on a Thursday. And I having experienced firsthand how caring they are. You know, I'm a big advert, advocate for the NHS and have been since that date onwards, very much so. However, on top of everything else I was dealing with, the several break, broken bones, the displaced eye socket, the fact that I went on to develop sleep apnea and type 2 diabetes from the attack. On top of dealing with all that, within a week of being in hospital, I managed to go and contract myself MRSA, yay me, and therefore spent over three months in hospital in isolation. And therefore, I guess this is quite a timely interview, given that the whole world is in lockdown at the moment to some extent or other. So I do have previous experience of needing to find resilience in a time of isolation for that three months plus all I dreamt of was getting back home again and to some normality which is what it was that I was seeking and within days of being back home I realised that the grass wasn't greener yes I was back home but not only was I housebound I was also living room bound because I still had a massive external fixator hanging out of my legs so I couldn't really walk much beyond the living room. I certainly couldn't have tackled stairs to get upstairs to the bedroom and personally I found the hardest time of isolation being back at home because whilst in hospital I had extended family and friends coming to visit me they thinking they were doing the right thing felt that when we were back at home that they needed to give us time to bond again as a family and I have to say sharing a living room which was also my bedroom bathroom and toilet which is known in medical terms as triangular living because I was between bed wheelchair and the dreaded commode in a room that was also the family living room shared with my wife Claire and then 15 year old daughter Tash who was studying for her GCSEs at the time that certainly wasn't just a test of my resilience and I have to give 
credit to both of them for what they had to put up with because I wasn't the easiest person to live with at that point. And it was during one of these moments, as I quite often say now, uh, staring at the magnolia walls reflecting that magnolia existence that I'm not going to claim that some sage came into the story and that was the turning point because that's just not how it happened. What's your next track going to be? My next track, based on the little bit that I've shared, or quite a bit that I've shared there, I'm going to go for Survivor from Destiny's Child. What were your first moments like when you woke up and the interview with the police and stuff like that? Did you have any idea why you'd been attacked? Let's go over that. The, the first thing just to say is it wasn't actually a case of waking up in hospital. The severity of the attack, I remember thinking at the time, and, and people find this really hard to conceive that the human brain can think like this. But I was thinking, whilst the attack was obviously imminent, I'm thinking, do I make a run to get back into the pub to a place of safety? Which then I'm telling myself that's not the way to go because what if I was to stay and get attacked outside, the attack would be purely on me, whereas if I got back inside, the attack could then have spread to my wife Claire and daughter Tash. I was also thinking that shows how severe the attack was whilst I was outside, I was going to be found that much more easily, whereas if we were attacked inside, by the time anyone realised that something was wrong when the doors didn't open the following day, it may well have been too late for us. So that was the option of flight ruled out. Looked at the option of fight as to whether I could take the baseball bat off the smallest one of them, bring them to the floor, and then whilst they tended to him, try and get out of the way. But realistically, firstly, I'm a believer that, as much as it sounds to be a corny cliche, I'm a believer that violence is never the answer. And even so, one unarmed man and his dog against three people wielding baseball bats it was never going to end well, and all I was going to do by trying to attack them was antagonise the situation and make it even more violent than it turned out to be. So that very much ruled out the option of fight, which just left me the option of freeze. And all I remember going through my head at the time was, stay out here, you'll be found quicker. One way or another, this attack can only go on for a relatively short period of time and then whatever happens happens and therefore the option of freeze seemed to be the the logical decision probably as a man the hardest decision to make that you were just going to stand there and take what was coming and that was the decision that i, I went with in that moment and shows how many times i tell this story to people afterwards and relate that incident to them, people can't comprehend that the human brain can have such a conversation and weigh up the pros and cons that I've just listed there within a split second. But once it's happened to you, you realise just how amazing the human brain is. But you didn't think it was game over? Um, at, at first not. At first I just thought it was about trying to get a message across because to this day we still don't know what the, the motive was. Um, I remember sort of laying there looking down at both the fib and the tib in my right leg through the skin staring back at me as I laid there. It was as, as graphic as that. And the reason I, I touched on the fact that I didn't wake up in hospital is once the attack moved to my head, it was apparent that it wasn't any longer just a vicious attack. It was an attempt to kill me. And I remember thinking, if I'm taking such a battering, whilst I'm able to defend myself, the moment I go unconscious, I'm a dead man, leaving Claire a widow and Tash without a dad going into a GCSE. So I had to find the resilience that it took in that moment to stay conscious because I was very aware 
ever the fact that was the only way that I was going to remain alive that night. I'm just taking us back to where we were before, because I've gone back and delved deeper. And I think that after a period of living in this triangular way in your house, where you, the living room was where you were sleeping, it was where you were washing, it was where you were needing the toilets, everything with your family. Um, I, you, you were getting to a point, I think, where maybe your perception of things switched and you saw things in a different way. So I want to take you back to there. So, yeah, laying in that bed where I was in the family living room, waking up as late as possible in the morning, watching hours upon hours of lame brain, daytime TV, before going back to sleep as early as possible just to make the days short enough to get through. Staring at the magnolia walls, reflecting my magnolia existence, thinking to myself, if this is all there is to life, has it really been worth fighting to survive those 12 hours plus operations over that three month period? And I think I was saying that so many people claim that a sage came into the life, waved, waved a magic wand and everything was fine from there. For me, it certainly didn't happen in that way. But something that did keep going through my head during those moments of reflecting was something that I'd heard years ago, and to this day I can't remember where it came from, so I'm not going to make something up just to make all the pieces fit. But I remember hearing years ago that people will do more for others than they will do for themselves. And that's what had got me through initially, the fact that I still wanted to be there as a husband to Claire, and that I didn't want to leave Tash without a dad when she was going through a GCSEs, which is a traumatic enough time for any 15 year old as it is without not knowing whether your dad was going to survive or not in addition to that and at that moment I didn't know how I was going to use what had happened to me and turn it from a negative happening to me into a positive not only for me but for as many other people in the world as I could help moving forward What's your next song going to be? Right, because I talked about how difficult it was for Claire, who was by my bedside every day that I wasn't under anaesthetic for that three months and had to literally do everything for me, living alongside me in that room. I'm going to go with Bette Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings because that is what she really was at that time. Everyone's story is different. Sometimes we look at other people and think that we've had, you know, oh, I've had it easy. Even you, you probably look at some people and think, oh, I'm fine. That What they went through was worse. For me, everyone I speak to, it's just really awe-inspiring. And you hit a really interesting nerve for me because I was, I, I, I'm really interested in psychology and mindset and what makes people tick and purpose. And I've been exploring a lot recently this argument for altruism that the more we focus on ourselves, the more we are limited by what we believe is possible for ourselves. So if you were stuck in this room with four magnolia walls, unable to go anywhere with unable to walk, unable to do anything for yourself, then self-centeredness was never going to make you magnificent because you were quite literally incapacitated, you're legless, right? But as soon as you start to think more globally about other people, well, hold on a second, what, what can I do to give back to my wife, to my daughter, to my friends? What purpose can I give myself in this world which is about other people? the possibilities become massive. And I think that that's what you're getting at. So how did you then find a way forward from there? Yeah, I'm not going to insult any of your listeners' intelligence by saying it was an overnight thing that I knew there and then how that difference was going to be made. To quote, and this is nothing new to that I've, that's, I'm created or anything, Simon Sinek gives a great talk on finding your why. And for me at that point, I had the why that I wanted to, that I referred to earlier, take what had happened to me and turn it into a positive. So I knew that that was the why 
I wanted to move forward with things, but the how didn't become as apparent. And initially, what I wanted to do was work with fellow trauma survivors, as I knew there would be empathy with them there from what I'd been through. However, what I was discovering was that fellow trauma survivors, it was either too raw for them to be working with me at the stage I was at, or their trauma had come about due to things that endured in their childhood. And as we've touched on throughout this interview, I was more than happy with the childhood and the upbringing and everything I had. So I wouldn't have had empathy there. And I'm not a person that's arrogant enough to think that everyone in my world is a potential client and I have the answer for everyone and I can save the world single-handedly. I don't believe that. So sadly, fellow trauma survivors weren't the group that I was able to work with. However, someone said, knowing what drove me, why didn't I go on to share this story with our next generation that we're still at an age group where they could be influenced to some degree and I could help them to become better young adults, which the more I thought about it, that seemed to be a fit because going back to when I was in hospital in isolation, if I can say there was any advantage to having MRSA, it was the fact that because I was in isolation, it was always the bank staff on nights, which got the night shift, who were given the isolation cubicles and therefore, given by this time, I've been moved from the orthopaedics ward onto a ward that was a vascular and plastics ward with this external fixator. And for any of your listeners who aren't familiar with an external fixator, the best way I can describe it is it was a mass of metal that looked like a group of intelligent men had gone berserk with a Meccano set. Uh, quite heavy, quite a sizable piece of, of metal with loads of screws and things in there. And not something that the staff were used to seeing on a vascular and plastics ward. So curiosity would get the better of them when they came onto the first night shift as bank staff and they would ask, oh, what's that? What's happened to you? And I would share the story. Quite often they would get emotional at that time, even though they were quite seasoned, caring professionals. And they would apologise for asking the question. And I reassured them not to feel bad about asking the question because what I was learning was that each time I shared that story, it was very cathartic for me. And I felt better and better each time I shared the story, which made me wrongly assume at that time that the way that everyone would deal with this was sharing the story. Moving forward, I found out that not everybody was comfortable sharing the story, but me sharing my story on behalf of the people who weren't comfortable with it then had that realisation that they weren't the only person in the world that had experienced something like this. They weren't the only person in the world that was suffering in that way or feeling that way. And they could see someone who was a few steps on because I personally see life very much as a ladder where with one hand up to the people further on the journey than we are to pull us up and a hand down pulling up people who are a couple of steps behind us to be able to help us. And I found by sharing my story, it was able to help the people who weren't comfortable sharing their own. Fantastic. And I can completely relate to that. I think the psychologists call it disclosure. Um, but let's listen to another track. What are you going to pick? I would say, given that, because obviously we've only got time to go into a certain amount of my story, given that I heard secondhand when I was first in hospital that... I probably wouldn't live and that if I did live, there was no chance of me walking again, even aided. Let's go with Fats Domino, I'm walking. In your new life, as it were, recovering from uh, what can only be described as an attempt on your life, really, um, 
you'd have looked at the sort of the message that you wanted to give out, the message of resilience and who you wanted to aim it at, which was the next generation, as opposed to fellow trauma survivors. But how did your first talk go about? How did it come about, sorry? The first talk came about as I'd realised by this time that I wanted to share my message with as many people as possible. And I think we touched on a little bit about networking events. So in Sheffield, there was a new networking event starting, which was then the Elite Network, now renamed the Evolve Network. And I realised that it had a 20-minute speaker and a 50-minute speaker at each event. And whilst... 20 minutes scared me to death I thought we don't grow in our comfort zones as we all know so if you're a speaker you've got to speak so I decided I would put a 20 minute speech together which covered my own story but making it about the audience rather than about me with that theme of resilience running through it I contacted the founder Will Polston who we're both familiar with and he said he'd heard good things about me but because that I had no showreel and he wanted to make sure he was only putting speakers of a certain caliber which I commend him for on his stage he would like me to go to either Toastmasters or PSA. Now at that time because PSA the Yorkshire was quite a distance and I was no longer able to travel independently and the Toastmasters was in Sheffield I went for the latter option I entered the table topics which for anyone not familiar with Toastmasters is an impromptu speaking where you pull a subject out of a hat and speak on it for one to two minutes I won the table topics the very first one that I entered posted a ribbon the winner's ribbon on the Evolve Network Facebook page and credit to Will being a man of his word as he is gave me a call and said in which of the five active locations would you like to be our 20 minute speaker first and my very first one even though I'm ambassador for the Sheffield Evolve Network was at the Evolve Network Manchester and what a small world it is because the evening I was due to speak there the host was taken ill and our mutual friend Sue Kerr who I believe has been on this show previously yeah. stood in as host <laughs> at Manchester and that was my very first public sharing of this story to anyone more than sort of nursing staff or doctors or the domestic in hospital on a one-to-one -one basis. And how did you find it? I would say in a way I was quite nervous because I didn't know how I was going to go down. I knew what I was sharing was from the heart, from a place of vulnerability and was authentic so I had nothing to worry about on the content from I was just concerned as to whether people would get it, whether people would understand why I was sharing what I was sharing and the feedback I got was just absolutely phenomenal which just reaffirmed to me that that was what I was destined to do moving forward. Well I certainly hope I get to see you on the stage and it's funny you know you mentioned Sue K. when I met you in Sheffield she was in that situation again wasn't she she had to step in for the 50 minute speaker if I'm not mistaken so um, how did you go from Evolve to schools and further education and, and speaking to those people? It was at one of those meetings where I'd included in there the fact that trauma survivors weren't the fit that I wanted them to be but I knew there'd be someone out there that needed to hear this message and someone at one of those meetings had said to me yes it's commendable what you're doing now and please carry on doing it to help people realise that with resilience they can move forward, they can achieve whatever it is they wanted to achieve. I think, as it hasn't worked out for you with trauma survivors, 
I think you really need to speak in secondary schools because I think they, more than anyone, really need to hear your message. Don't talk not to crack, can't they? That, yeah. that was my fear, to be yeah. to be honest, Martin. I, I thought they were going to be, and I'll be honest, I went along to the first school I was going to speak at, didn't let it be known that it was the first school because I always say, no one wants to be sitting on a plane on the tarmac prior to take off when the captain welcomes everybody aboard his first ever flight. It's not very reassuring. So I didn't tell the school they were my first school. And before I went into the classroom, I was told by the teacher that they were probably the, the most disinterested, disruptive and disengaged audience that I would ever be in front of. And he wasn't telling me that to put me off my game. It was just telling me that about this particular class so that I didn't feel bad or take it personally effectively when it bombed. And I went in there, I delivered the 20 minute version of my talk that I normally delivered at networking events. And therefore it was aimed at adult audiences and therefore meant I was speaking to year sevens who are roughly 11 years of age mm. as though they were mm. adults. And for that reason, I kid you not, Martin, I had 20 minutes of pin drop silence from start to finish whilst I delivered that talk to them. And with regards to them saying they were going to be disengaged, I'd got a whole hour's worth of PowerPoint slides, although I didn't want it to go down the route of death by PowerPoint, and interactive activities to try and keep them engaged. And literally the whole rest of that lesson was with all 30 hands in the class, in the air, with one question after another, after another. And I was really glad that it worked that way because as a 50 year old man, I don't believe that my story answers every question that an 11 year old has. And the best way for me to know that I leave that lesson with every question answered is for me to ask them, what questions do they want answering with regards to the talk and the underlying message? Fantastic. So what do you think the song going to be? I talked about my mum being my late mum. And I think for me, one of the biggest tests of my own resilience were watching her struggle against Alzheimer's and dementia for a number of years, taking her from being a really strong, independent person to someone who towards the end needed turning over in bed every two hours and this is a hard one for me because this is a song that means so much because it was played at, at mum's funeral it's Bette Midler and the Rose. Time to put you on the spot you help people oh, okay. with resilience obviously you've got a story but I know that you've probably got a number of takeaway points as well a number of principles mechanisms or methods that you can use or that people at home listening can use to make themselves more resilient so tell us how it's done roger over to you right i think we've touched on probably the biggest one so hopefully i've not given the steak away too early as well as the sizzle but for me one of the biggest things about resilience is to the focus off yourself and putting it on others and the story focus off myself and put it on my wife Claire not wanting to leave her a widow and on Tash who I didn't want to go through a GCSEs without having a dad beyond there the focus was expanded out to adults wanting to better themselves on Networking at networking events, as we spoke about, and beyond there, it went on to our next generation, whether that be in primary, secondary schools, or in colleges. So that was one of them. Take the focus off yourself and put it on others. Another one that I'm a big believer in is to make light of things, to bring humour into things and even when I share this personal story which is quite a dark story I still make sure that humour is included within it because I again I wouldn't want to use humour to offend anyone 
but I think that self-deprecating humour is one of the best forms of humour out there. And for me, that certainly worked to the degree where, to say we're less than seven years on from that fateful transformational day, so many people would still be stuck seeing themselves as a victim, playing the victim and in the victim mindset at the moment. I've got to such a stage through what I believe in and by eating my own cooking, as a good friend of mine would say, with resilience, that I give it round about this time last year, maybe a little bit longer ago than that, I entered this very story into a humorous speaking competition, which uh, had a bit of a mixed response. Some, some people were like, wow, hats off for doing that. And other people were like, that is just weird and sick to do that. But for me, it's what was required. And I think the last thing that I'd like to share for the moment, because I could talk about resilience all day and all night, but I think I still love your listeners at that point. I think for me, the last one is to have empathy, which again, I usually talk about, particularly in the classrooms, because more often than not, I'll get a student put the hand up and say, if you came across the three people now, sir, would you punch me in the face? And again, I go on to reiterate that violence is never the answer, but they're quite surprised when I tell them that if I came across the three people now, which could happen because they were never identified, let alone brought to justice, I would shake them by the hand and thank them for the positive difference that they've made in my life. Because the last thing I want to talk about under resilience is empathy, understanding the thoughts and feelings of another. And whilst I can't condone what those three people did to me, and I could never go on to do to someone else what they did to me, then I have the empathy to realise that they thought what they were doing was the right thing, whether that was due to their own childhood trauma, addiction, affliction, or whatever else it may be. And through having the empathy to put myself in the situation to try and understand what they must have been thinking at the time, that is why I list empathy as one of the big pillars of resilience. Have you forgiven them? Very much so, yeah. I mean, for me to be able to say I could literally shake them by the hand. I mean, this is not the way that I word it in the classroom, but I know you're very much about transformation, and transformation is a big word for, for me as well. Life before was about serving pints of Stella to people that needed a listening ear. And now life is about not only positively changing lives, but when it comes to giving hope to people who may be on the verge of or contemplating suicide. It may be that hearing my message isn't just about changing lives, it's about saving lives. And for me, there's no bigger calling in the world than that. Beautiful. Okay. And um, what's your next track while you're on that note? My next track, based on what we've talked about so far, is going to be Billy Paul only the strongest survive thank you very much again for the fantastic interview um you, you you really have given us a lot of food for thought on resilience um and there's so many different angles that people can come in on and i think that you've come in on on some really good ones i like the, the humor line but i love the idea of thinking about other people rather than yourself and you know the funny thing is a lot of people reach a certain age and they end up rejecting the religion that they grew up with for whatever reason, right? I'm not pro-religion or anti-religious, but a lot of the time they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And when I say that, the baby I'm talking about is this idea, it doesn't matter which religion you talk about, the idea that you love your neighbour as yourself, that you think more about other people than yourself. And that's certainly the thing that I've took away mostly from this, is it doesn't matter what happens to us, if we think about others, that will make us more resilient and it will make us more purposeful. Um, 
But as you've said at the start of the interview, we're going, we're all going through a period now where we've got to be resilient, where we're locked down either on our own or with the same people in the same four walls day in, day out. What is post-COVID life going to look like for Roger Cheatham as a speaker and as a person? Wow, there's a question. And that's yeah, certainly I do not like me. to bomb him in there. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great because it's certainly not one that people have had years of experience to be able to answer. I think we're all finding our feet very much at the moment. For me, as someone who always looks for the, what's the saying, the silver lining in every cloud, the opportunity in every adversity, life is going to be even better moving forward because I'm not one of these people who's saying in the time of COVID-19 that you need to be doing something, you need to be producing, you need to be creating. I think my advice to anybody in these unprecedented times is you need to be doing what is right for you and if treating this as an extended holiday is right for you, if just being rather than doing is right for you, then if that's right for you, that's right for you. And don't worry about the judgment of others, which again comes into, there you go, bonus tip there on resilience. Don't worry about what other people think, what others think of you is none of your business, is a big belief of mine. I personally am using this time to adapt. And again, adaptability tends to come into resilience as well, rather than thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? There's all those next generation out there and we can't do anything for them at the moment because the schools are closed, etc. That's never crossed my mind. What I have been doing is engaging with quite a few parent groups given that the schools are closed at the moment. My original intention was to create an online course moving forward so I can get this message out in front of more people at once because a lot of people in the world need help and only one of me. However, that said, from talking with the parents, the biggest issue that most students are suffering with at the moment is not being in contact with their own peer group. That seems to be the big issue and I'm Obviously, resilience comes into mental health, and I'm very aware of the fight that COVID-19 is overshadowing the fact that the isolation can be detrimental to the mental health of our next generation, and also that domestic violence is also being overshadowed by this at the moment. So with regards to what I can do, rather than what I can't control and knowing that is the biggest issue I am currently working on a program where not just doing an online program that they access but where I'm going to be going on Zoom and delivering a resilience workshop on a daily basis for an hour a day Monday to Friday as a, as a pilot scheme and I'm aiming to bring together a minimum of at least 10 students on that pilot on that pilot program, which therefore recreates something of a classroom environment with their own peer group. And therefore that's, address, that's addressing the biggest issue they have at the moment before I even start sharing any of my resilience teachings with them. From that, the intention is because Hopefully COVID-19 is not going to be with us forever. So the, the idea of that is A, to do something in the moment for our next generation and also to gather feedback from that as to what works well, what could be improved upon with a view to putting together an evergreen online programme that addresses the longer term issues of our next generation moving forward for when we come out of this, the other end. Because I don't believe we're ever going to go back to normal as we knew it before I believe we're going to go forward after this to a new normal. I agree now uh, we have come to the end of the interview so Roger 
if anybody wants to contact you because they want you to be a part of their project, probably online, how can they reach you? By email, roger at rogercheatham.com or check me out on my website, which is www.rogercheatham.com. Roger, um, let me first of all thank you for coming on the show and I want to thank everybody who's watched and everybody who has listened on radio or heard the podcast that will ne inevitably come out. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to leave it to you, Roger, to say your last words to our audience and tell us your last track as well. Right, okay. As far as last words go, I would say when it comes to resilience, remember it's not just about bouncing back from adversity. It's about springing forward big time and when it comes to the last track firstly i'd like to thank you martin for being such an amazing host and thank you to all the listeners that have stayed with us through the course of the interview and because i've talked a lot about taking the focus off yourself and putting it on others i think there's no better track to end with than brian adams everything i do i do it for you the Culture Bot with Martin Morrison.